Okay, so I'm his wife. I'm Shannon. Okay, so I'll just say this. The lady that's fixing to come up here has spent more time pouring into lives than any person in this room. She is a giant in the faith. She loves the Lord. She preaches the word. And she is one of the most amazing people I have ever met, which that doesn't hold a lot of water, but she's one of the most amazing people that probably hundreds of thousands have met. So I'll introduce Miss Susan Bozarth, my friend, my teacher, my confidant. She's amazing. I love you. And she came here, you know. Yeah, those, those little sterile introductions are just kind of, they're kind of sterile, so. Gosh, you guys make me sound so good. Thank you, Shannon. Wow. It is such a privilege to be with you guys tonight. We drove through a storm to get here to you. So, <laughs> uh, but it is worth it. And I see some familiar faces. I'm so excited to see Kervin and Candace. What a wonderful uh, opportunity to meet you guys and see some of your team. And, of course, uh, Shannon and Pastor Joey inviting me to come. So these, these guys were all my students a few years ago, and now you're the leaders and changing the world. And, and that's why I do what I do uh, is just to see who I can impact and, and get out there and stir things up. And, of course, having Gabe lead worship from Trinity Church in Cedar Hill and his wife, Laura here, and my friend Mary's here, and they're doing workshops tomorrow, so you guys don't want to miss those either. So it's just a privilege to be with you, and I'm so, I'm so proud of what Shannon and, and Pastor Joey are doing. I haven't had a chance to find out what they're doing, but I know I'm already proud of it, <laughs> uh, just because I know you and I know your heart. Uh, I've been at Christ for the Nations for a long time. That's a Bible institute in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I started teaching there in about, well, I got there. My husband and I moved there from pastoring churches um, we moved back there in 92. We were students back in 1975. I know some of you weren't born yet. Shut up. Some of you were, though, as I look across the room. <laughs> I see that some of you. See, I'm so used to talking to young people. I'm so thrilled there's old people here tonight. That's wonderful. Because if I tell some stories, you'll know what I'm talking about. Because when I mention some things in classes, they're looking at me like, what is she talking about? Like Andy Griffith. Who's that? They don't know. So um, isn't that sad? They don't know who Andy Griffith is. Yeah, and if I use the, you know, if I tell, tell a story about a phone booth or something, they don't know what a phone booth is. And I said, listen, that's where Superman changes his clothes. But anyway, they don't know. They don't know any of that. So I'm so glad some old people are here tonight with me as senior citizens. I got an e I'm going to speak here in just a minute. I'm just sharing. I got an email the other day, and, and there, it was about a luncheon for some older people, and they used the word, word elderly. And I thought, I ain't going to that lunch. <laughs> I will go to a... Senior citizen, even though I don't even like that. But elderly, oh, no. No, that's not going to happen. Not going to be elderly. Um, so you're going to enjoy the workshops. I know at least three of the speakers, and I just met one tonight. Uh, so you will enjoy all those workshops as well. Tonight I want to talk to you about trusting God in the dark. Now, that may not sound real exciting, but I'm telling you, there's not going to be a revival until we know how to trust God in the dark. Because there are seasons in our life that come that don't make sense, and don't we like things to make sense? When we, pref when we prefer that anything that happens to us, if we just understood why, it seems like we could handle it better. So they're trusting God in the dark. There's a story of a little boy who was afraid of the dark. And his mother kept sending him out. He's saying, honey, she said, honey, go out to the porch and bring mommy the broom. And he said, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. And she said, it's okay. Jesus is out there. And so he said, I don't want to go. And she'd say, honey, go get mommy the broom. And he'd say, I don't want to go out there. It's dark. And she'd say, Jesus is out there. So about the third time, she said, honey, I need the broom. Go get mommy the broom. So he went over to the back porch, and he opened the door, and he said, Jesus, if you're out there, hand me the broom. <laughs> Bless our time together tonight in Jesus' name, amen. We don't like the dark, do we? We don't like circumstances that put us in a dark place where we're not sure what's happening. The world that you and I live in today, it's different. Do you believe that? It is a different time to see the things that are happening in our culture, in our world today, just sometimes shakes me to my very core. I've never heard, I, he, I yell at the TV. Do you yell at the TV when I'm listening to the news? I yell at it. I'm thinking, are you crazy? You can't really believe that. And yet they do. So the world we live in of Christian faith is not 
a make-believe world. It's not a fantastic fairy tale where there are never any questions or never any problems. Wouldn't that be nice? Or no emotional trauma of any kind. But rather, we live in a world of faith with doubt sitting on our shoulder looking for any opening to pounce with such force as to knock us off our feet. I think it's just been in the last oh, maybe month, maybe a little bit longer, where we have heard of two influencers in the body of Christ that have left the faith and one young minister who committed suicide. Now, can I tell you that is, that is grievous to me. And the problem with these two influencers that lost the faith is that they didn't do it just by themselves. No, no, they had to get on Facebook and advertise that I've now turned away from the faith. So they're turning away from the faith and they're trying to get followers after their own dissipation. That makes me mad. I, I'd like to track them down, but I, I tell the students I will stalk you on Facebook. I will. So we live in a world where people are losing their faith and they're so confused about who they are and the, and the gospel has been, has been uh, uh, watered down. Can I say something to you? I'm going to. The gospel does not need to be tweaked. Truth is truth. And only truth sets us free. Programs don't set us free. But anyway, that's, that's, another, that's another message for another time. But as Christians, our faith is being attacked on every level. It seems that the only stance that is not acceptable in our culture today is what? Being a Christian. Everything else is accepted. Not only is it accepted, it's celebrated. Yay! I'm a, well, I won't go into that. I won't say that. But they celebrate their perversion. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to celebrate perversion. We can love the people, but I'm not going to celebrate their perversion. And so we live in this crazy culture where people are wanting us to celebrate things that are not truth. And the truth is watered down. And to say you're a Christian, that's the only thing that's marginalized and set aside. Almost any ideology is accepted and even celebrated, as I said. I heard a pastor say the other day, I was... I, can't remember who it was or I'd give him credit. But he said we, after I use it twice, Corbin, then it's mine. That's how I, you know what I mean? Yeah, you give credit the first time. The second time you say somebody said, and the third time I said, so. <laughs> but I heard a pastor say that we must face the fact that many in America today are considered an unreached people group. That's sobering. And the problem worsens because we feel so inept sometimes and we feel like our intellectual deficiencies are highlighted in our weak response and then doubt pursues on what it is we really believe. And so weak, anemic sentiments and platitudes will not stand in the face of challenging, difficult questions about what we believe and why we believe it. So no wonder we falter in this disbelieving age. The cultural situation we face with Christian beliefs and values not just being re rejected, but being mocked, publicly mocked and ridiculed has provoked serious doubt for many Christians because they want their life to be easy. They want the path to be smooth, and they want everybody to love them. And that, believe me, does not happen. I put on Facebook the other day that I don't know if my mom did something right or did something wrong, but I always assume everybody likes me. And then I find out some of them don't. And it's shocking. It's always shocking to me that somebody wouldn't like me. I believe what is most damaging, though, to fellow believers is not the fact that, that Christians doubt. We all doubt. But our lack of honesty regarding our own personal struggles with doubt. And so we present a lifestyle that all's good, everything's okay, no problems, everything's fine. And people sitting out there or students sitting out there are thinking, I can never attain that kind of lifestyle. There is something wrong with me because I must be the only one that has doubts. I'm telling you, you're not. We all wrestle and struggle with the principles that we believe are true. And yet, sometimes they don't seem to be working in our lives. It's beneficial to have a healthy understanding of doubt because, ready or not, testing and trials are coming to all of us. Uh, Goliath is coming if you haven't already met him. Are you encouraged so far? 
And you have to be prepared for Goliath. Don't be afraid of him. Be prepared. Faith, as one author, another one suggested, is a radical reliance on God. And may I add, without the benefit of his explanation. I would like God to explain himself. You know what I mean? Just explain this to me. That's from I Love Lucy. Faith is believing in advance what will only make sense when it's past, maybe. See, maybe you will never understand. Maybe you will never get the explanation you so desire. What are you going to do? You're going to keep walking. Because we walk and live by faith, not by our emotions, not by the, not by the incidents in our life, good or bad. It's not, it's not faith in our faith. It's not faith in our friends. It's not faith in our church. It's not faith in our Bible knowledge. These are all substitutes, and they will come up short if we try to rely on those during times of doubt, struggle, testing, and dark season. Sometimes you have to be able to stand alone, just you and Jesus. Listen, I love corporate anointing. Can I tell you, I sound good in corporate anointing. I mean, I do. I sing so good. I do. I mean, I'm listening to myself. I mean, man, you're good. You're, it's, it's, but it's corporate anointing. And we can feel strong in corporate anointing, can't we? We can feel determined and we can feel like I can run through a troop and I can leap over a wall and I can lay hands on the sick. And then one day you stand by yourself and everybody has left you. And you have to determine whether you are able to walk this out because you know it's truth, not based on any props that are around you. And I'm certainly not calling worship a prop, but you know what I'm saying. So it's not faith in anything else. They're all substitutes. Listen, doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Unbelief is. To believe is to be of one mind. To disbelieve is to be then of another mind. So to doubt is to be in between. It's kind of a halfway mark. But if we don't check our doubt, it can move into unbelief. Doubt is not always fatal, but it's always serious. To too many Christians today, faith is a boring, joyless affair because there has been a subtle mixing of Christian and non-Christian ideas that have slipped into our gatherings, and that's the truth. People are half-hearted because they're double-minded. Let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. But no, no, we want the maybe in between. People are double-minded because they are half-hearted. Half-hearted because they're double-minded. So they want the best of both worlds, but they find the best of neither, and they find the worst of each. It's interesting. Aren't we a mess? We must know what and why we believe. Listen, here's what we've done, you guys, y'all. We humans, that's us, in many ways, we have scaled God down to our image. And we have substituted our viewpoint of God or what we think about God. We've substituted that for God himself. It's what we think is more important than who he really is. It's, well, what do you think? We put our God concepts, if you will, or how we think about God, over God and we use them as a means to justify what we're doing. Hold on. But even worse, we make judgments on what God should be doing. How many of you ever offered God a good plan? I mean, I have given God good plans. I would never give him a bad plan. I give him good plans. I give him dates when it could happen. You know what I mean? Well, if it, I give him names of who he can use. I offer phone numbers. and I mean, I, I give him good plans. They make sense. And, and why don't you listen to me? This is a good plan. It makes such good sense. We make judgments on what he should be doing. You know what we're doing? In essence, we're taking God to court. We take God to court and we, we put him on the witness stand. And we pummel him, throw at him questions that we know will probably not be answered at least 
to our satisfaction. We have a tendency to create substitutes or idols. We love our idols because we make them. Is it okay to question God? He doesn't get nervous. God does not get nervous by our question. Oh, no, she's asking another question. He, God does not get nervous by our question. Some of you need to hear that tonight. Your struggles, you're feeling condemned because you've, you've questioned God. He does not get nervous. Questions like the big one, why? Have you ever just asked the why question? Why not step in? Why, why not act? Why, why, why didn't you make it right? Why, why didn't you heal? Why didn't you part the clouds and provide a moment just for me to catch my breath? Why, why everything at once? Why? I had a pastor friend call me some months ago, and he asked me to speak on a particular title. It was He wanted me to speak on, I think it was called Sustaining Spiritual Victory. And I said, well, pastor... If I have three days in a row with spiritual victory, I'll let you know how I sustained it. I, mean, I was afraid he was going to withdraw his invitation. He didn't. But, but it just comes at you all at once, doesn't it? Just one thing after another. I read a great article on this topic, and here's an excerpt. This is what the author says. He said, not only am I okay asking those why questions, but I think there is something holy and sacred in being courageous enough to ask them. Don't be fooled. Those questions are only to be asked by the courageous. It's easy to spout trite Christian platitudes designed to make people feel better and bumper st with bumper sticker theology. But insipid axioms do little in the face of the actual brokenness of the world. Oh, dear God. I took care of my husband for 10 years. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's at age 57. That's young for some of you. You know that's young. And I kept him at home, and I took care of him for 10 years, and it was hard. And I had a lot of why questions. I won't go into all that now, but I had a lot of why questions. But one day I was on campus, and I was in between classes. And so I was sitting down. I taught one class. I sat down talking to students in a a former student came up, none of you guys, <laughs> an older former student lady came up to me and she said, and you guys know me so you won't be shocked on how I handled this because I didn't handle it well. Um, she came up to, she said, uh, she said, well, how, how are you doing and, and how's Randy doing? And I said, well, not very good and it's, it's very difficult. And she looked at me and she said, it's all good. <laughs> I mean... I should have probably just let it go. But see, I use it as a teachable moment because I'm always trying to help people. That's my, isn't Mary, isn't that my heart? I'm always trying to help. Whether I'm at a restaurant or a store or where I just try to help people with their ignorance. <laughs> That's why. And I looked, and I, and I listen, I knew what she meant. She did not mean that in a, in a bad way. She just didn't know what to say. You know what? If you don't know what to say, shut up. Yeah. The next book I write is going to be The Dumb Things Christians Say. So if you don't know what to say, just, just so I know she just was saying it maybe out of nerves because I told her the truth. See what I, people get nervous when you tell them the truth, don't they? See if I would have said, oh, it's okay, not it, God's in control. If I would have just said something like that, and God is con in control, by the way. So if I would have said that, then she would have been okay. But because I'm, I'm brutal, and I said, no, it's hard. I'm having a difficult time. It's all good. It's not all good. And I looked at her. I said, no, it's because it's a teachable moment. I said, no, it's not all good. It will be all good, but right at this moment, it's, it's stinking. It's no good. And so guess what my next class was? Effective biblical counseling. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, go, I go up to my class, effective biblical counseling, this, and the room's full of young faces, and they're just ready to go. And I blast them. I mean, because I'm still, I'm just still, I just blast them with this and then I saw their faces and I said 
All right, so what I have done for you is I have shown you the five stages of grief all at once. I, <laughs> I've, done, I've done this for you on purpose. They didn't believe it either. But anyway, it's not all good. And these little platitudes, when people are hurting and broken and confused and have fear and anxiety, a little saying does not help. It wow. makes it worse. Better to say, you know what the best thing is to do? Weep with those who weep. The most spiritual thing you can do is put your arm around somebody when they're going through something and just weep with them. There's a story of a, a woman that came out looking for her little boy and she looked across the street and he had climbed over a fence and was sitting on the porch of an old gentleman that had just lost his wife. And he was sitting on the old gentleman's lap and, and the mother didn't know what was going on. Finally, the little boy came home and she said, honey, what were you doing? And he said, oh, I was just helping him cry. Listen, sometimes that's all you can do. When somebody is broken and carrying a load that is more than they can bear seemingly is just help them cry. Don't give them a saying. It's all good. He goes on. I think it is more courageous to ask the hard questions of God and wait for him to answer than it is to find hope on the side of a coffee mug. <laughs> Asking those questions requires courage because in the end it is very, very likely they will not be answered, at least not in our timing or in the way we want him to answer. Look at this text, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Later, when Paul will write, it is when we are weak that the strength of Christ is seen. That just seems crazy, doesn't it? But when we are at our weakest, his strength is at the strongest. In other words, when we can't do it any longer, have you ever said, I just can't take one more thing? Guess what happens? One more thing comes. And what do you do? You take it. You have no choice. We're always looking for a way of escape. Always. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. That's very human. But there has to be contentment in our reality. Regardless of what it is, finding that contentment when we can't do it any longer, when we are fed up, when it's become too much, when we have nothing left, when we feel like we are empty, when it's beyond our capability to deal with it, then in that moment, the strength of God, resurrection will be seen. And until we get to that point, we will rely on ourselves to handle it and take care of the problem. And I'm going to tell you right now, you can't. When you can no longer hold on, he holds on to you. Do you know how many times I've used that through those years? When I felt like I was just scraping the side of the pit I was in, my fingernails going down the sides. <laughs> and I'd try to yank myself up and pull up, and I think, I'm, I'm going down. And he goes, I got you. I got you. You're going down. I got you. Towards the end of Randy's sickness, and he didn't know who I was anymore, and he couldn't talk to me and you guys remember him as a teacher I'm sure he couldn't talk he didn't know who I was it was difficult so many seasons and he would get fearful because strange people were coming in and taking his blood and do, and so I would go over to him all the time and I'd say I got you I got you that's all you could say is I got you when he took his last breath that's what I said I held his hand I got you listen life is it'll throw you some curveballs and when you can no longer hold on, he will hold on to you. I had so many people ask me, well, how long? How long are you going to take care of him? I mean, you just can't do that. Well, first of all, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. How many of you do those personality anagrams? Have any of you done those yet? Okay, I'm an eight. <laughs> just, just so you know. Uh, anyway, that's that, you'll all go look it up now later. You'll Google it, and you'll find something wrong with it, and you'll tell me about it tomorrow. But that's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, because people do that. You know what I mean. They do that. 
what was I going to tell you? Let's call this, let's call this team ministry. What was I going to do? Yeah, I don't want people to tell me what to do, but I had a point. What was it? <laughs> Somebody tell me. Mary, what was I going to say? <laughs> oh, how long? Thank you, Kervit. See, team ministry right here. And so they would say, how long, how long are you going to do this? And so in my mind, you know, you said, I, and I said, well, I, I guess until he doesn't know me anymore. Uh, of course, another big one was when he couldn't take care of himself anymore as far as going to the bathroom and stuff. I just, he was big, six foot four, 250 pounds, a big man. And I thought, well, I, I can't do that. I want to tell you something. I did that and more for 10 years. You know why? Because his grace is sufficient. When you can't hold on, he holds on to you. And whatever level of stress that you face, if you will hold steady, his grace just goes right with it. And that's how he holds on to you. And I did that and more. I shaved him and showered him and bathed him and fed him and brushed his teeth and combed his hair and put lotion on his feet and picked him up off the floor. You do whatever you have to do by the strength of his grace that meets any need you may have. Do not fear. Whatever, whatever you walk through, there will be a grace that will rise to the area that you need at the moment you need it. Don't you look at somebody and say, I could never do that. You're not anointed to live their life. You're anointed to live your life. And whatever you face, there will be an anointing on your life to walk that thing out with your head up and your shoulders back with the determination, I'm not going down. How many times it was like the friends of Job saying, just curse God and die. He has failed you, hasn't he, this time? He's failed you, hasn't he, this time? God does not owe us any explanation. And when I got to that point, when we can no longer hold on, he'll hold on to us. There are several books I read every year. One of them is Ragmuffin Gospel by Brendan Manning. One of them is The Pursuit of God by E.W. Tozer. Another one is The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis. And another one is called Ruthless Trust. Ruthless Trust. What and why we believe it's not blind faith. There's more substance to why we believe than that. Listen, our faith is not blind. It's just the opposite. Faith is not blind. Faith sees. It sees the invisible. It sees the possibility. It sees the miracle. It sees the options. It sees the opportunities. Faith is not blind. That's a, that's a wrong saying. It's, it sees. We can walk in the dark of our circumstances because we're not in the dark about God. That's good right there. You can tweet it. Go ahead. We can walk. We can walk in the darkness of our circumstances because we are not in the dark about God. Unless each of us wrestle with these truths ourselves, here's what's going to happen. We will end up with opinions rather than convictions. And opinions are fleeting. You know what I mean? They, they, they come and go. It's our convictions that our are our foundations. And no conviction is truly our own unless we are prepared to hold it, even if the rest of the world is against it. That's when you know it is your conviction. I got saved. I was a skinny little 18-year-old girl Catholic in a little, uh, little town in Midwest Illinois, and uh, a young man came through town. He had just gotten out of the Navy, rededicated his life to the Lord, and in a few months, uh, he had led me to the Lord, and then he became my husband a few months later. Um, but I was raised Catholic, and, and I started ministry. You know how I started ministry? On the streets of New York City, giving my testimony. Because being a Catholic, that got, because they didn't think Catholics could get saved. Did you know that? That's way back when. But they didn't. And I, and I said, well, ta-da, here, here I am. And we would go to New York City, and we'd be out on the streets and getting ready to witness. I was 18. I was so excited. But we would sing a song. Don't get nervous, Gabe. I'm singing. Hush. Because I sound good, although there's not a corporate anointing right now. But, uh, 
But we would stand there in the streets in Brooklyn and we would sing. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. But then this next verse. If none go with me, still I will follow. If none go with me, still I will follow. If none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. You have to understand when I was singing that, I wasn't married yet. My family had thought I was in a cult. And all my friends left me like I had leprosy. Uh, they said I made them nervous. <laughs> no, wait. They weren't nervous when I was driving drunk down the road and playing chicken with the car coming at us. Or hiding Budweiser under my bed and then sli slipping out the window and hiding from the policeman and then going drag racing. That didn't make them nervous, Hervin. But when I decided <laughs> to follow... Listen, so when I stood there at 18, I thought, I am not turning back. I'm going to gut. I am not. I am going to finish this race. And listen, this summer, it'll be fi this coming summer, 50 years. I know I don't look that old, but Jesus help me. I have, a, I have a child that's 46. I know you don't care. But when I think, this has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I'm just sharing. <laughs> I just, you know what I mean? It comes up once in a while, the, the realization that I have, a ch I have a child that's 46. A child. And see, in my mind, I'm like 48. So, see, it doesn't, no, it doesn't match. See, I have people in here that understand. Thank you for coming. Martin Luther, defending himself before the Roman emperor, closes his appeal with these words. My conscience is taken captive by God's word. I cannot and will not recant on anything. On this I take my stand. I can do no other, so help me God. Listen, clever thinking and a kind heart can be made impotent if there is no commitment. Listen, we're living in a day where commitment to anything seems to be optional. People try marriage. They try tithing. <laughs> They try praying. No, no, those aren't things you try. Those are things you commit to. And you commit to your commitment. So those are the things we have to get a hold of. We don't try these things. And we have a generation that's coming up that, that they try things. We have got to help bring an impartation. But listen, listen, you guys, we need you, you young people. We need you. We are depending on you. To take this next move that's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And we need you to, to help move it forward. We'll help you facilitate because I'm not done. Right. We're not done, any of us. We're not done. But we need you. You know why? Because you'll do whatever God calls you because you don't know any better. You'll just jump off a roof if he says to. That's why, listen, that's why God always uses young people. Because they don't question. They just say, oh, I'm supposed to go over that mountain. Okay, here I go. That's why God always starts a movement with young people. Because they don't know any better, and that's exciting. I usually ask my students, how many of you are 18? They raise their hands. I look at them, I say, you know nothing. You know absolutely nothing. <laughs> but you'll learn. You guys okay? Do you still <laughs> receive from me? What happens to our faith? I'm almost done. It seems that people do not so much totally lose their faith but we just stop using it. Because, because for us, it's, it's, we don't have to pray. You know, some people live just to survive. You understand that? They get up in the morning, and their whole goal is whether they can find clean water to drink for the day. And so it takes faith. And I'm not saying we're not living by, but we don't, we don't use our faith like we used to because we've learned. How many of you know how to act like a Christian? Come on, we do. We all know how to, we all know how to act that way. But what's, what's really stirring in here? We don't, we don't use our faith, and I'm including me in this. We don't use our faith like we used to. If we don't put our faith to use, it will become useless. That's deep right there. <laughs> if we don't put our faith to use, it will become useless. This is how doubt works. Little by little, choice by choice, thought by thought. Faith is not torn up in one big rip. It becomes frayed on the corners. 
seems to be slowly eaten away bite by bite by disappointment by disappointment. Expectation that was not fulfilled. The questions we asked God that he did not do. Disappointments. Why didn't God heal my husband? Why didn't he? I had everybody who's anybody and then some people that were nobody come pray for him. I didn't care. Just anybody. I grabbed a mailman, mailman off the street one time. Come in. <laughs> and just do something. Get me out of this mess and get him out of that hospital bed. Why wasn't he healed? I used to go out at night and we have a pool in our backyard. And once the whole day was over and I'd get him in bed, I would go out and sit by the pool. And I sat in these chairs. I called them my crying chairs. Because I'd go out there and just cry. <laughs> like, oh, dear God, <laughs> you've left me. And I wasn't totally alone, but, you know, I was pretty much alone. These, all these people over here helped me. Right over here. Gabe used to help me pick my husband up off the floor. Uh, Mary used to come over, just talk to me, let me cry. We'd go out to lunch with people, and I'd start crying, and everybody felt sorry for me, but she stood with me through all of it. It was so embarrassing. Uh, Shannon used to bring me food because she knows I hate to cook. What a gift that was. <laughs> so all these people helped me. But there was still, it was still, I was, at night, everybody went home to their homes. And I was still stuck with this unbelievable trauma in my life. And I sat out there one night and I said, Lord, this was after a few years. I said, Lord, I have committed to take care of him the rest of his life. That was, I mean, I had, that was done. I was not putting him in a home. I was not putting him anywhere. I'm taking care of him, back off. I'm taking care of him the rest of his life. But the next thing that came out of my mouth, and I said, Lord, if I never do anything else in my life but take care of him for the rest of my life, so be it. And there was just a freedom because I had gone from escape to commitment, to contentment, to be content in your reality. Nothing had changed except I got up and I was no longer looking for any kind of escape. It didn't matter if I ever spoke, taught, traveled, did anything again. Uh, there's a freedom in that kind of commitment and then contentment comes. All right, let me close with this. God remains true in spite of of how we feel he is not missing because we can't see him he is not missing because we can't see him I know when Chad I tell a lot of stories about Chad he's my 35 year old son I've got a granddaughter who's 21 I know you don't care but I'm sharing I'm sharing a 21 year old grandma got married I could be a great grandmother oh dear God I said Abby please don't have kids please not yet great grandma oh here's great grandma oh, no no, 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 that's a world gone mad. Can't happen. But when Chad was little, uh, we lived in Hilton Head Island and lived in a lovely home on a golf course, and behind us was a lagoon that had alligators in it. And so when Chad was little, he liked to hide from Mommy, and he liked to see my blood pressure go up. You know what I mean? And so I would be home alone with him, and I couldn't find him, and I would go check and make sure the doors were all locked to make sure he hadn't snuck out to go visit the alligators. And so one day I saw that the doors were locked, so I knew he wasn't outside. So I knew he was in the house someplace. So I'm, I'm going around, and I can't find, I'm saying, Chad, Chad, he won't answer. So finally I said, oh, look at this little puppy. I know that's not good psychology. <laughs> but don't judge me. I was, a, I was a desperate mother. There was no puppy, but I said, oh, come look at this little puppy. I thought for sure, and I'd explain it later. So I'm going up the stairs, and I look over in the guest room, and I see the curtains moving a little bit, and I look a little closer. Here's his little feet sticking out from under the curtain. But he thought, because he couldn't see me, I couldn't see him. See? And so we feel that way about God. Just because we can't see him doesn't mean he can't see us. Our emotions may have temporarily betrayed us, but our faith in God and his faithfulness are still intact. One more story. I went through a, a season of sickness. Personally, this was before Randy. It was, it was a long couple of years 
they never really diagnosed what it was. I had blisters on my throat. I couldn't swallow. It was just, it was just awful. Uh, and Randy took care of me. And I went for a long time, and I just could not get out of it. And that's the biggest lie of the enemy, isn't it? When you're going through something, the enemy says, this is now the rest of your life. But that's, that's another sermon as well. But anyway, so one, I was fighting that thing. One morning, I woke up. It was still dark. And I had not slept. And I was just getting ready to, I was dozing. I just thought, oh, man, I can go to sleep now. Because you know how early in the morning sometimes you can just. But the birds were outside my window making noise and singing. And I remember thinking, what are you doing? It's dark out. Why are you singing? It's dark. You guys, I heard the Holy Spirit say, they're singing because they know the sun is getting ready to shine. Oh, listen, you guys. That I mean, I didn't get healed right that moment, but such hope rose in my heart. And I thought, it's dark out, but they're singing. Faith is the bird that sings while it's yet dark. Stand up with me. Micah 7, 8 says, I love this scripture, do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. Don't be ashamed of your doubt. Don't feel condemned of your why questions. Know that when you can no longer hold on, he's going to hold on to you. Doubt is part of life. Don't panic about it. Don't think you have done some unpardonable sin because you have doubt. Everybody has doubt. Just like everybody's dysfunctional, in case you didn't know that. Everybody, everybody, everybody's dysfunctional. Doesn't that make you feel better? Uh, God will hold on to you, and there will be a grace that comes into your life. And so I don't know what all we're going to do here, but I'm just going to pray a, a general prayer. And if you want to come up later, I'm going to be here, and I think there's a prayer team uh, for ministry. But I don't want anybody to leave here tonight feeling discouraged or despair or having the thoughts of, I cannot face one more thing. Listen, God wants to move in a brand new way. There, listen, there is revival happening it is coming, but we have to be at our best. We have to be ready to stand up and say, yes, sir, I'm ready for battle. And do you ever, have you ever just gone through so much you get sick of yourself? I'm serious. I mean, I, when I go through long periods of time, I think, I am so sick of me. I cannot even stand it anymore. And so I can't wait to find somebody else that's got a problem worse than mine. I know that sounds terrible. <laughs> But we have to get ourselves together so that we are soldiers prepared for the battle that is raging right now. And may I just say this, it's probably going to get worse before it gets better, but don't fear. It's as we go forward as soldiers, we break the curse off of these things, we get our life together, we get rid of our doubt and our insecurities and the why this and the why that, feeling sorry for ourselves, and we stand up and we say, yes, sir, to whatever it is you are calling me to do. Father, I thank you tonight for these men and women of destiny. I thank you, Lord, that you have great plans and strategies for this church. I thank you, Lord, that it's not here by just chance or accident. It was, it was ordained by you, established in this community. And I thank you for these men and women and these young people that have come and they're standing, believing you, Lord, for great freedom and victory in their lives tonight. Father, I thank you that you give them faith and strength that they can face whatever they have to face because the anointing is on their life to do it. Father, I thank you that you will show them they're so much stronger than they think they are. Father, I pray blessing of provision for all this, this congregation, everybody in here, a blessing of strength, encouragement, a soundness of mind, a hope for the future, a clarity in their thinking. Father, I thank you that you surround them with favor right now as a shield against every fiery dart of doubt and unbelief. And we walk again with faith, knowing that we can trust you, ruthlessly trust you with our very lives. Father, I pray blessing and provision in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.